Good afternoon. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And on behalf of Tom McNutt, executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of our library and foundation colleagues, including the foundation board members who are here with us today, I welcome all of you and those watching live on C-SPAN to this 50-year retrospective on the presidency of John F. Kennedy. The last time we had a conference on President's Day, the entire East Coast was hit by a blizzard, overturning a year's worth of careful planning. So given the amount of snow we've received this past winter, this morning's snowstorm seems a mere dusting, and I'm pleased it has prevented only one of our speakers from making it here this afternoon. As I hope many of you have noticed, the library has been busy these past months commemorating the 50th anniversary of JFK's election, his farewell to Massachusetts, and his historic inaugural. We've launched two new websites, jfklibrary.org and jfk50.org, and the nation's largest online presidential digital archives. Invoking President Kennedy's own words, we celebrate the past to awaken the future. Our goal in these efforts is to not only highlight crucial, this crucial moment in our country's history, but also to connect it to the challenges of our time. We have also, in recent months, said farewell to two of the President's closest aides and associates, Theodore Sorensen and Sergeant Shriver, whose contributions to the Kennedy Presidency and to the Kennedy Library and to the spirit of our nation are manifold and immeasurable. They are sorely missed. Today's conference kicks off what will be three years of programming devoted to marking various 50th anniversaries of the Kennedy Presidency. As you can see on the back of your program this spring, we offer a session with Senator Christopher Dodd, Elaine Jones, Paul Thoreau, and others on the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps, a forum on the Bay of Pigs invasions with one of the members of the Cuban Brigade and historians of the period, and a film and discussion on the Freedom Rides with at least one and we hope more of the Freedom Riders in attendance. After the death of President Kennedy, W.H. Auden wrote, what he was, he was, what he is fated to be depends on us. Today, we pause to hear in this first panel from those who knew John F. Kennedy personally or worked for his administration to recall for us the man and the spirit of the times. We will then listen to five historians who have written books and essays on President Kennedy and conclude with three contemporary political analysts on how the policies and ideals represented by John F. Kennedy resonate in our politics today. To give as much time to our speakers, we'll allow the biographical information in your programs to suffice and keep these opening comments and introductions as brief as possible. And to keep the conversations moving briskly, we'll take written questions from the audience. So please use the index cards uh, that were given out when you came in and turn your questions into the library staff who will be collecting them during each session. Unfortunately, the one person who the weather has prevented from joining us is Caroline Kennedy. But she is here if the technology gods cooperate with us by phone. Our 50th anniversary programming would not have been possible were it not for the leadership of the Kennedy Library Foundation's President Caroline Kennedy. Along with her husband, Ed Schlossberg, Caroline inspired our digital archives project and the launch of our new website, as well as organizing events in our nation's capital featuring President Obama and Vice President Biden and a concert at the Kennedy Center with the likes of Yo-Yo Ma, Herbie Hancock, and Paul Simon. It is an honor to work with her. We're often cheered by her wit, informed by her insights, and encouraged by her dedication to her parents and all that they stood for. And while it is not Saturday night, please join me in welcoming, live from New York, <laughs> Caroline Kennedy. Good afternoon. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and thank all of you for braving the weather to celebrate President's Day at the Kennedy Library. I'm sorry I'm not there with you, but I have a few words of welcome and introduction that I hope will give you some sense of how proud we at the Kennedy Library and in our family are to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy presidency this year. All my life people have told me that my father changed their lives. They decided to run for public office, join the Peace Corps and the Civil Rights Movement, and serve in their communities because for the first time, they felt that someone asked them to. He made them feel that they had something special to give back to this country that has given us all so much. 
Last month, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of my father's inaugural address, words that redefine what it means to be an American. Those words and the deeds that followed inspired a generation that transformed this country and passed that inspiration on to their children and grandchildren. And now we must answer the call to service for our own time. Today, we hope to find guidance and inspiration in the past as we seek to do that. The United States is a country built on words and ideas. The promises of the Declaration of Independence and the framework of the Constitution are what hold us together, not religion, not a king, or a common language or culture. But throughout our history, each generation has turned to those founding ideals and reinterpreted them to help meet the challenges of its time. My father's speeches on public service, civil rights, space exploration, and the strategy of peace have been added to the words that have changed our world. These are the words and speeches that are housed in the Kennedy Library. And through conferences like this and our new digital archive and websites, we are making them available to a worldwide audience through the internet and for the very first time. My father's time is becoming part of history rather than living memory. And we need now more than ever to reach across the generations in new ways and recommit our country to the ideals we associate with the Kennedy presidency, the pursuit of peace and justice, the exploration of space and the preservation of our environment, the celebration of arts and culture, and the inclusion of those left out and left behind. As today's society becomes increasingly fragmented, we can return to President Kennedy's words and ideals to find inspiration and renew our common heritage. Too many young people are increasingly disconnected from politics, but I hope my father's words and example will remind them and all Americans that public service is a noble endeavor and that we each have a responsibility to make this world a better place. I want to thank all our speakers here today, especially the next three panelists, Harris Wofford, Dick Donahue, and Roger Wilkins, who served in my father's administration and made such an immense difference. And the historians and journalists who we will hear from later will help us better understand this period in our nation's history and its relevance today. I also want to thank the library and foundation staff who have worked to make this conference possible, and most importantly, all of you who are here with us this afternoon and watching on C-SPAN. Thanks so much for coming, and it's now my pleasure to turn the proceedings over to Tom Oliphant to moderate our opening panel. Uh, thank you so much, Caroline, and welcome to all of you. I just wanted to quickly pick up on something Tom Putnam said, which is how strange and how weird and how sad it is to be here today without the help of Ted Sorensen. Um, practically from the day this place opened, um, his wisdom, his perspective, his wit, his amazing ability with language has enlivened these affairs going back a long time. Working with him was a real honor, and I miss him very much. But we've got these fine-looking young men <laughs> who were who were also there, and who also have been, I should point out, very dedicated participants in events here to uh, help us uh, not only keep the history on, alive, but, but understand it better. <coughs> and I'm going to go down, down the row here, just to physically place them in history for a second. Senator Wofford, if you could please tell us where you were on Inauguration Day, and where the office was that you went to the day after the inauguration. <laughs> the uh, place where I was on Inauguration Day was huddling with my wife in front of the Capitol, uh, about the 20th or 30th row, trying to keep warm, enjoy the sun and the beautiful blue sky on historic day. And the office, I, the office, uh, I didn't have any uh, job uh, after the inauguration. 
until Sergeant Schreiber called on the telephone and uh, said, well, we thought it was a joke that we found jobs in the talent search for everybody that we thought was good for the government except ourselves. And my wife didn't think that was very funny because we had a mortgage to pay and didn't think that Schreiber uh, and my should laugh in the same degree. And he called up after the inauguration and said, well, we do have a job. At the inaugural parade, the president asked, uh, would I look into this idea of the Peace Corps and recommend to him what he should do about it? And let's get together a task force and meet me at the Mayflower, where for night and day, for some, hotel. some weeks, the Mayflower Hotel. <laughs> for, those, the for those of you who came on the Mayflower, this was the hotel. <laughs> very good. He hasn't added that he is the source of one of the most interesting and exciting stories about the end of the 1960 campaign, which, uh, which we're going to get to in a second. But Dick Donahue here, um, a long time ago, in 1961, Teddy White used an adverb to describe Mr. Donahue that I had never heard before he wrote it and have never seen used to describe a person in public life again. In the making of the president, 1960, Dick Donahue, one of the key people in the campaign, is described by Teddy White as coruscatingly brilliant young lawyer. <laughs> I've never known anybody, sir, who was coruscatingly brilliant. I haven't either. <laughs> Does this mean you return Teddy White's phone calls? No. <laughs> but tell me, tell me about that day, where you were with your wife, Nancy, I presume, and where you reported for work the day after. I was uh, in the audience several roads back, not nearly as close as Harris, uh, but just as cold, and uh, we shivered our way through and then stumbled downtown uh, to go to what was my new office, which was in the West Wing of the White House. Now, how we got there is a um, trick in itself, because until a president is inaugurated, he doesn't hold office as far as the uh, uh, Secret Service is concerned, and the a a access to the property of the White House is an altogether mysterious thing. We had had some scouting go out and find out who sat where and what places, because each president makes a new course for himself, a new audience, and goes from there. So we had staked out, because we were in charge, the second floor of the West Wing. <laughs> And we let some other people come and join us, uh, but not for long. Uh, if they were very good, we found them out. If they weren't, we fired them. But uh, as a result, I was in the second floor. Larry O'Brien was in one corner. I was in the next corner. And uh, from there, uh, I just started to work. So that's where I worked from. Where what, what was your first job in the White House, Dick, after being such a critical player in the campaign? Well, I, the only job I got was after the president was elected and uh, he came to the uh, armory and, uh, and we met uh, then at Bobby's house. Uh, and he said uh, to Larry, uh, you and Dick can work on putting together the government, but you've got to get some these jobs for people. And so I was in the patronage business, if you will, <laughs> from that point on. And I never lost the ability to receive requests from anybody who walked by or who saw, because they just thought I must have the keys to the kingdom, which I did not. Sort of. Now, Roger, um, your contact is somewhat different. And yet it's also so similar to that of hundreds, thousands of young people who flock to Washington 
to try to be part of this. Um, you come from royalty, really, in the civil rights movement. His uncle was Roy Wilkins, the head of the NAACP. You had worked in the campaign, but on Inauguration Day, you weren't there yet. How did you get there? Well, 50 years ago, I was 29 years old. I was a stupid young kid. Um, I had worked in campaign. I certainly uh, preferred, by, well, preferred isn't even the word, but devoutly praying that John F. Kennedy would win the election. Um, I was also involved in a, with a senior partner in a big lawsuit that uh, was going on. So we started watching the um, inauguration in my boss's office, and then all of a sudden we had to go down to town to take a deposition or something. And on the way downtown, on the way back, I thought, why am I doing this deposition? And I don't want to be a lawyer all my life. God, would it be good to go to Washington? And, but see, I didn't know people like Donahue and Salinger and all those guys were around the president. Um, I didn't know them. And I kind of thought of them as rock stars. I mean, and that's because... Dick's never been called that either. Well, <laughs> not only that, they were rock stars before they really were rock stars. I mean, the Beatles didn't come for, you know... A couple more years. A couple, yeah. But I also had done some work on African issues, the emerging uh, countries out of colonialism, and um, I was doing some of that work, and uh, someone mentioned to me that I could maybe go and work in the foreign aid program. Um, and I was moved by the president's uh, saying, Eve, come on, serve the country. Uh, this, is, this is not a me, me, me. It's an us, us, us. Let's, let's get together and make the country better. And that moved me very deeply. And I thought, well, gee, that's a great thing. And I read all these stories about this young flood of young people, idealistic young people going into Washington. Fortunately for me, that's a guy, that older lawyer who was in the law firm, um, got to be the head of the foreign aid program. His name was Fowler Hamilton. By this time, the president seems to have been pushing on people saying, let's get some minorities in here. And it, they were, you know, and they were at the part where somebody who got the order would say, well, who knows one? <laughs> <laughs> and, fortune, and so a young associate of Mr. Hamilton, when he got his heat, he said, well, who knows one? The guy says, you know that kid who was in that law firm? And you said when he sometimes said something, he was smart? He said, oh. And that's how I went to Washington. And then you went. <laughs> Dick, ha help us out. And I want to ask a different version of this question of Senator Wofford, too. But you worked with him constantly. Mm. throughout the long campaign. Yep. And then the election comes. Did he change? Did it, was it different interacting with him after he was elected president? How did he change? What was it like working with him once you were out of a, a, a cauldron of the campaign? Well, he never stopped campaigning. I mean, he was a politician. That was his job. That was, that was his... Uh, capacity in life. So he was always concerned about politics. But as far as we were concerned, he was no longer just Jack. He, not that he had ever been Jackie or worried like that. <laughs> he had just been the president. And now he was the president. You thought of him and you referred to him and you worked with him as if he were president. And if what he says goes, which is the thing that comes with presidents, they do get authority. 
Did you always call him Mr. President? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me about it. Before you start, I just wanted you to help us understand the expectations of an equally idealistic young man 50 years ago when you joined up uh, and began working on civil rights issues. Well, I think I better make you an honest man and get myself located in the White House. Yes, please. <laughs> May have been through Dick Donna. <laughs> oh, um, you, excuse me. Um, he was a very powerful man in terms of jobs. But in any case, the morning of uh, the president seeing Father Hesburgh of Notre Dame and the head of uh, Michigan State University of the Civil Rights Commission to get their recommendations. I had been called over by Mrs. Lincoln to entertain them in, in the outer office because the president was running late. And that's not Mrs. Lincoln, that Mrs. Yeah. <laughs> this no. is Evelyn Lincoln, the yeah. president's Mrs. secretary. Mrs. Evelyn Lincoln. Um, and and uh, they told me, they showed me their 10 points they were going to present to the president, the last of which was that he should have a special assistant to the president for civil rights because no one had been in the, in the White House with a commitment to that agenda. And they said, and we're going to recommend you. And I said, well, I've agreed to be deputy to Sergeant Shriver. I'm having the time of my life. He's more fun to work with. I've ever worked with anybody. Um, and um, I'm really fixed. And uh, they went in to see the president. I went home. They called me after their meeting and said, either you or the president was putting us on. Because when we got to our 10th point, he said, I do have a special assistant for civil rights in, on my staff here in the White House, Harris Walker. <laughs> and, and, and I called my wife and I said, I think I'm going to be hearing something from the White House. Um, what, what do you think we should do? And she said, of course, if, if he wants you, you should do it and be very happy about it. But um, the call came. I went over, and Mrs. Lincoln said, the president would like to see you as soon as possible. I went over. Uh, I was in the outer office. A great friend of mine, Tom Hughes, was witness to this. He was soon to be head of intelligence research in the State Department. Um, and uh, I'm standing there starting to tell him what I was there for because he, I was bumping his time. Uh, Mr. Who was uh, Mr. Johnson, a man in black suit that swears people in? Do you remember his name? Um, he appeared uh, with a Bible, and he said to Hughes, uh, are you Mr. Wofford? He said, no, that's Mr. Wofford. <laughs> and he said, would you please raise your right hand and take the oath of office? And I said, but I don't know what office. <laughs> and he said, that's not my job, Mr. Lover. Uh, I was told by Mrs. Lincoln the president wanted you sworn in immediately. And it went back and forth for 30 or 60 seconds. And I took the oath of office and um, then went in to see the president. And he, he said, Sarge can't have everybody. Um, we need you on this agenda. You can help him on the Peace Corps to the extent you have time, but we want you here. Uh, it, it was about a four-minute session with him. We've got the agenda. You know what the agenda is. Um, go do it. And uh, I think soon afterwards I had an office in the executive office building and was trying to do it. With a fireplace? With what? With a fireplace? Oh, well, one of the wonderful Good. suites, big right. and much more spacious than the White so House. So apparently, <laughs> for all the controversy there would be about civil rights over the following year or two, it was uppermost in his mind. Did you ever have any doubt about that? I started uh, supporting John Kennedy in 1957 most of all for his view of the world that he had laid out in two great speeches on Algeria and Poland as test cases of why we have to support the independent movements and why we need a new, more flexible approach to the diversity in the communist world. And um, secondly, my attachment to Hubert Humphrey, who was a passionate, uh, uh, committed uh, man battling for civil rights, uh, was great. Um, my admiration for Adlai Stevenson was considerable, 
but I had had a session with him on civil rights and the Civil Rights Commission where I worked with Father Hesper um, and was very disappointed with his readiness to take action or readiness to deal with the problem. Uh, when, when I first talked to John Kennedy about civil rights, which was second issue for me, the number one issue was the view of the world. Um, he was clear, very clear, that uh, segregation and racial discrimination was wrong and we have to find the ways and means to solve that problem. Uh, it's a big problem on our country. I had no doubt that his number one issue was foreign policy, his number one interest, but I didn't have any doubt but that he wanted to take the action which he, in the campaign, had very eloquently Could I, I'm going to ask Roger for uh, his take on this as a prelude to putting something on Dick's shoulders for a second. But as you began to realize that maybe you didn't want to take depositions for the rest of your life with all this excitement going on, what were your expectations for what you thought was going to happen in the country that made you want to do this? Well, first of all, I, uh, Harris is such a modest man. <laughs> um, to us in the administration who knew what Harris was doing and that he was in the White House, to us he was the great white hope. <laughs> <laughs> Here he is. Um, remember, this is the end of the Eisenhower administration. The South was burbling with black young people uh, doing their best to assert their rights as American citizens, like ride on a bus across state lines, um, like go to a state university, um, uh, to sit on a lunch counter. And they were doing this. And it took the greatest bravery. I mean, because people got killed doing that. And it was, it was not just black kids, it was black kids, white kids. And so what I expect, and President Eisenhower, in the face of the total straight in your face um, move by Governor Faubus in, in Arkansas, closing the school and not taking responsibility for the legal direction to integrate the schools. And if you, there was a picture of a black girl, pretty black girl, walking in the street in Little Rock and being hassled. And she was a very pretty girl. She's nicely dressed in her books. She was screamed at about all these harpies. It was just terrible. So you listen to Jack Kennedy very carefully. What did you hear? I heard him say, life is unfair and it's wrong. It's wrong for it to be unfair in this country. Um, so and I was disgusted by President Eisenhower. Um, surely did not see uh, Nixon as an alternative. We were Democrats. We didn't do that. And Kennedy's youth and his idealism on lots of things um, uh, just turned off, turned on the aspirations for justice. Dick, how, how did he talk in terms of interpreting the victory he had won? I mean, we constantly hear that he was acutely conscious of how razor thin the margin was, mm -hmm. um, envisaged a slow build up to a successful reelection when more might be possible. But this is all relevant because it all uh, came to a head around the issue of civil rights and the question of how far and how fast President Kennedy felt he had the leeway to go. So could you talk to us a little bit about what it was like to hear him talk about his victory and his mandate. 
Well, his victory was a very, very narrow one, and he was not unmindful of it. As we went and tried to talk to Democrats in the House who had control about in, uh, enabling him to uh, pass his legislation, they would raise the issue, well, I don't tell me about my district. I got more votes than he did. <laughs> and so that was the most common comeback. I got more votes than he got. So we had to persuade them if we could. We'll give them a shot. Take a chance on this bill. See how it goes. If you get hurt, we don't want you defeated. We want you back here. But pay attention. If we do well, we maybe we'll do it again. So we were constantly working from day one to get um, a feeling of confidence in our party. And plus the fact, in a different way, we had Republicans who would join in issues. And so I had one of my groups was the Republican House members uh, from New England, basically, uh, who would join in, in uh, uh, our legislation. But he was constantly com com commenting on our ability to enact civil rights. But one of our problems was that if we were enacting civil rights with an antagonistic Congress, we weren't going to pass other things. So it was a balancing act in which he was constantly pressing us, how are we getting together the coalition? And we did make a coalition, as a matter of fact, it was the last thing I worked on was the Civil Rights Act, and that's why I left, because I knew the coalition was complete. We had, at that time, obtained a commitment from one of the leading right-wing Republicans uh, who would join with the Kennedy bill, and that's where I felt my, my work was over. So that a, but it was required to build that coalition in order to get it passed. Did that mean, I mean, with your own ears, did, did you hear him say in the first year or so, no, we can't do no. this now because uh, we're not ready to succeed politically at it? No, he just, he was always worried about the now. The question is, will, will we be able to move the legislation? The first thing we had to do was, of course, to get the expansion of the Rules, the Rules Committee. That was in the first week of the presidency, That's right. right. How and many then, extra members? Three? Yeah, well, yeah. three, and then, but we also had that beloved leader, Judge Smith. <laughs> and, you know, this was the rules of the House in those days. He went home to Virginia. The committee would not meet unless the chairman was there, and they wouldn't pass anything unless the chairman okayed it. So he was very much the uh, uh, massacrist uh, <laughs> of uh, legislation. Uh, so we had to work around him, and I can remember trying to work with the Democrats to expand the Rules Committee. And they would say, well, why would we do that? And, well, you know, Judge Smith. Well, you know, Judge Smith was just a crusty old Southern redneck. <laughs> but, uh, so, but uh, we've tried to get around it, uh, and, uh, but... There was also a fellow from Mississippi who was, oh, yeah. uh, who was a godfather to, among others, uh, Trent Lott, Bill Colmer. Yeah, Colmer was a beautiful man. Uh, <laughs> no, he was not. Uh, <laughs> he was never beautiful. Uh, <laughs> no. did, did the political difficulties confronting the president, and civil rights is one example, hmm. we, could, we could pick others. Did, did they make sense to you, Senator Wofford, or did you think his vision was too pinched uh, after the... Let, let me put it this way. In, a, in addition to the problems of Congress facing any civil rights legislation of importance, uh, there was, a, I think, a deep understanding in, with John Kennedy from Boston, similar to the understanding that Lyndon Johnson from Texas had from Austin to Boston, um, as to the depth of the problem in the, with the body politic and with the American people. Um, I never had any doubt from the first to the last conversations with Kennedy that 
the things in the platform, the things he said in the campaign, uh, and the things that needed to be done were all pretty clear in his head. But he also, clear in his head, um, at every step, uh, was realizing the possible backlash that you covered with the Boston School trauma. Uh, I, I, I was reminded of that in the, in the description the of right. the Pulitzer Prize you got. Um, the, the white people of the North, whether it was in the Civil War and the, the race riots in New York or what happened in Boston on school segregation, um, had among, in their minds in part or part of the populace very important parts. Sufficient Sir Johnson, when he came to sign the civil rights legislation that Kennedy had asked for before he died, uh, Johnson said, we're losing the South for the next 20 years. And so that was always a concern. Did now, Kennedy have the same fear or concern that the long-term political damage would be that serious? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt. He knew that he knew this, what the, these the steps yeah. would, would be precarious politically. Um, he, the, the, the most critical moment in my experience of almost the first 500 days in the White House on civil rights was when he had to tell Martin Luther King that contrary to the Democratic platform, they would not go forward with legislation in the session of Congress. It was a, great, a position that I personally agreed with, that it would have been a backlash not only in, in long terms if, it, if, uh, if they had moved fast and failed at that point, point. It would have been a fiasco in Congress. The Democrats, a quarter of them were segregationists from, from the South in the Senate, would filibuster. We would gain nothing except sort of witness for the truth. And John Kennedy was very much a practical man who wanted to solve the problem and not to, to uh, be a witness to truth if you didn't move it forward. Right. It, it hurt me because my little baby compared to the big civil rights issue, was signing the executive order on discrimination in housing. Right. Um, when he picked me up on the streets of Georgetown after I had been shifted in the campaign from speech writing to working with Shriver on civil rights because of ties to Martin Luther King and commitment to the civil rights movement, he said, tick off the things that we need to do. And, and the, about the third or fourth thing, uh, I gave to him in this ride up to Capitol Hill in his convertible, impatiently tapping as he drove the car up there. Um, uh, I said, sign the executive order uh, ending discrimination in publicly assisted housing with one stroke of a pen. You can do it. And he, in his debate with Nixon when civil rights came up, said, with one stroke of a pen, I will, you know, sign the executive <laughs> order. So twice while I was there, uh, the executive order was ready, approved by the attorney general, and within the last 12 hours before announcing, uh, I was called once by him explaining why. Uh, one case, it was the southern support that he was needed for his domestic legislation. He would lose or that they were going to lose in the coming by-election, uh, and he agreed to postpone it. Uh, twice it was postponed. It wasn't as easy as you think uh, to sign one stroke of a pen. I learned that. When the civil rights movement, Roy Wilkins was one of the ringleaders of this, sent Ringling. pens that said one stroke of a pen to the White <laughs> House. And allegedly, when the first batch came in, the president said, send him over to Wofford. He gave me that line, <laughs> right? Now, now the, the civil rights decision not to go forward with legislation uh, required Kennedy seeing Martin Luther King for a very serious 30, 40-minute yeah. talk in the private quarters of the White House. Both of them were at their best. As, as, as we left, we were worried that King would come out and attack mm -hmm. this decision. He never really did. Kennedy said we're going to go very hard on winning the right to vote, very, very hard on employment, and um, we're going to come to legislation, but we can't do it until we have a reasonable chance of winning. When we walked out, Martin Luther King said, well, I believed, I hoped that we would have a president that had the 
uh, un intellect to understand the problem and the political skill to know how to solve it and the moral commitment and passion to see it through. I'm convinced that he has the first two. We'll see about the third. Roger, from where you sat, you would have been inside by now. You, I'm sure, were fully aware of these developments and the, the tensions they sometimes created. And in fact, I ran across once a, a really fascinating memo that you wrote in 1962, toward the end uh, of the year, after Meredith had gotten into Ole Miss, uh, uh, so uh, there was some momentum, but it was uh, really from the heart. And in effect, you were arguing, uh, observing, that the president's actions in civil rights to that point had difficulty in your head going beyond uh, the definition of tokenism and that there was something missing. And after absorbing the history lesson from, from the great Wofford, um, how did you, what, what caused you to, I mean, there must have been people you talked to all the time on the inside who felt like you did and you thought it was time to send this memo through the White House so it would get noticed. Why? And how did President Kennedy react to that kind of advocacy? The, um as I indicated before, the, the, what the Freedom Riders and other people in the South were willing to do uh, stirred millions of people in the North, but particularly black people, because you said to yourself, look at these kids. You know, John Lewis is a, now a senior member of the. He, he was a kid then. Right. And he's just a little guy, and he would just stand, he would just. As I, I said in a number of speeches, that John Lewis was the bravest man in America. But there are a lot of other brave people, too, who it seemed to me were not getting the response. It's not because of Harris. But it probably just it wasn't coming out of there, and I thought it needed to come up. And that it ought to come from somebody who they knew and who was not just an abstraction to them, poor black kid or poor white or white college kids. And, and I should also say, I give my respects, a lot of my thought during those days was formed by uh, James Bob Baldwin, whom I had just uh, met, and I started reading all this stuff. And I was angry. And, and, and also, you know, when, when you get to start rolling, you get angry for yourself. And I was mad that I was born in a segregated hospital, and I was mad that I was sent to segregated schools, and I was mad that when my dad died, he had to be buried in a segregated cemetery. And all the rest of the scrunch that goes with it into your life, but you can't do anything about it, all of a sudden came to the fore. And I said, well, what can I do? Well, I'm in the government. They will listen to me. I can communicate with him, well, who should I send it to? And Dungan and I had a working relationship. Explain. Ralph Dungan. Ralph Dungan was a special assistant to the president for, and I think his job was executive um, appointments. And so I would go in, and he would, but he also was to overlook the aid <laughs> program that I was in. So he'd call me in, ask about the aid program. I'd tell him three things about the aid program, and then I'd switch to civil rights. <laughs> And I said, you tell the president, blah, 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 blah. He must have gotten sick of me. <laughs> anyway, um, he finally said, I can't, you, you know all of this stuff, Roger. You know it. I don't know it. Uh, I try to tell him, but I really, but if you write it, I will make sure that he sees it and reads it. So I said I would do that. And I have, I'm very stupid, I lost the, I lost the, in, in some move or so, I lost a copy of the thing. I think maybe it was the best thing I ever wrote. Um, and it surely was full of respectful steam. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's ask Dick. Was I'm sure. I will tell you how it was, can I tell you how it was received? Yeah. That's, I had to that's, that's pump myself up to really do this. 
And I said, those kids are out there doing that. What are you doing here? What are you, a man or a lump of... You can fill it in. <laughs> and so I wrote it, and I sent it. And I, um, the result was that the attorney... I was called to the White House by Lee White, the president's uh, counsel, whom I'd never met. Do you think the president doesn't think about this? I said, I think he thinks about it, but he doesn't do enough about it. So, uh, fortunately, Ralph was a very easygoing, nice man. Um, and my, but then I permitted other people to see what I'd written. Um, and I got a lot of sure support. Did. And so a lot of other people began to move. Um, and <laughs> the Attorney General said, I mean, they opens up some jobs in the White House for blacks that they hadn't had, and they did some other things. Um, but the Attorney General of the United States loved his brother very much. He said, who is this kid think he is? He's green nipping with the ease. He, <laughs> he doesn't know anything. Uh -huh. And he will never, never work in this department as long as <laughs> I am attorney general. <laughs> How long did that last? Uh? Well, it, it lasted because um, I got to be the assistant attorney general after he was senator That's in New York. <laughs> and There's he, a story there about whether you were from Washington or New York. Oh, right? We'll did. get into That's, that. But Dick Donahue, help us understand something about how President Kennedy operated. Um, when people were passionately urging him to do things and his caution light was, was flashing, um, we, some of us have a lot more experience remembering what it was like to really lean on Bob Kennedy mm -hmm. or later Edward Kennedy, you know, on issues like Vietnam or uh, whatever. Um, but how did the president ta ta take his exposure to people who passionately wanted him to do more than he felt he, it was safe to do? That is almost everybody he saw all day. <laughs> I was about to say. <laughs> everybody is passionate. Everybody is very, very forceful and are advocates. I mean, that's how they get there. They somehow get an appointment to get in there. Uh, he could deal with them with an equanimity that was amazing. How'd he do it? What Just it like? with a, he heard them out. He did not shut them off or shut them down. He heard them out, and he would debate them in a, in a gentle way. Uh, he would respond and uh, basically attempt to appoint uh, his own position. But it was, and it was very, very graceful, but it was very forceful because he would not bow and scrape or apologize. He would attempt to explain his position, and then it would, that would be it. Uh, but he frequently heard the same arguments from the same different people on the same issues over and over and over again. And eventually, of course, uh, he would come to the point where he knew that he, if he was assured that he could get the votes, which is, again, what a politician does, is try to get the votes. And he knew he could get the votes. Then he was, you know, march, let's go. Was he decisive? Oh, quick as a wink. It makes me want to ask you, Senator, to tell us the story from the campaign about the arrest of Martin Luther King. Because it, I mean, we've been talking about the president's ability to understand his non-landslide and, and how it introduced some caution into his decision making. But this was with a couple of weeks to go in the campaign. Um, Reverend King had been arrested in Albany, Georgia, some, somewhere. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia, in a, a sit-in that the young militants right. had insisted on, and he joined. Right. Uh, right. He didn't favor it during right. the election campaign, but he ended up in jail. Right. And a judge, on a technicality, basically, uh, sentenced him to four months, not in the Atlanta jail, 
but in the state penitentiary where you can get killed. No, the other way around, Tom. Oh. The, the, the trip to the state penitentiary was a terrible ride in the night yeah. from the county right. jail. That's First right. they were arrested in Atlanta, and Mayor Hartsfield, with some nudging from some of us, um, released them all. The county judge in, invoked the, uh, the parole that he was on for driving with an out-of-state driver's license with and William Smith, the novelist. Yeah. In the middle of the night, he, had, he was put on a parole for several months of hard labor for that, that uh, charge. Uh, the county judge seized him, um, sentenced him to four months hard labor, and soon afterwards, in the middle of the night, in chains, according to Andy Young and others that I've read, uh, went without knowing where he was going to the state penitentiary. Uh, the negotiations that Robert Kennedy and Burke Marshall and others that had with the governor and Morris Abram um, understood that the penitentiary was to get him out of a dangerous county right. judge right. and in a place right. where the state could protect him. Um, meanwhile, Nixon had said, first place, it was a scandal in the whole world. Uh, all over the world and in the American right. politics. Uh, secondly, Nixon had said no comment to the whole affair. And uh, naturally, we in the civil rights sections and, and Kennedy wanted to say something and he had a strong statement issued, ready to go. And the governor of Georgia, according to what I understand, said, we'll get him out if you don't issue any public statement. Anyway, uh, Coretta King calls me um, in panic in a way, th way I'd never heard. She was six months pregnant. She had heard about the ride to the penitentiary. Can't you do something? And um, after talking to her, I turned to Louis Martin, my African-American colleague and under Shriver in the civil rights section, and said, you know, if these beautiful, passionate Kennedys would just show their passion in a situation like this, <laughs> um, a call to her from the senator would really be uh, something that in, the, in her despair would give her courage and hope. It was mixed motives. It was something we thought was good for the campaign. It was absolutely, uh, for me and when Kennedy did it, um, a thought that this would be good in its own right. And didn't Bob her. Kennedy follow Shriver up? took the idea and said, I don't, an O'Hare Airport, Chicago, hope I'm not arrested and, and hope I can see Jack by myself to propose this. Uh, he called some time later and said, I made it. I waited till Dick Donahue or uh, <laughs> Salinger or Brian or Sorensen had left the room. And finally, uh, Kenny O'Donnell went to the John, I think, and Sarge said, Schreiber said, you've been trying to figure out what to do. What about calling her? And he, Kennedy fought for, according to Schreiber, for 30 seconds, said, that's a very good idea. Do you have her number? Shriver called, her, dialed it. They talked. Daddy King, hearing this, then yeah. made it public, uh, said he had been on a full-page ad for Nixon as a, a Baptist uh, minister's ad supporting Nixon. Um, said, he said, if he has the courage to call my daughter-in-law and wipe the tears from her eyes, I have the courage to vote for a Catholic right. for president. And we got a million copies or more Ouch. of a little <laughs> pamphlet and uh, I, before black churches saying, I, no comment, Nixon versus a candidate with a heart. I thought I wrote... But, but, but uh, it, you know, it was... Think of the spontaneity of that. Yeah. Uh, think of what Robert Kennedy thought when he learned that Schreiber had proposed that without clearing with the head of the campaign. Well, somebody told me they once went that, wild and they, somebody told, they told me once us, that Bob Kennedy us. called the judge. Uh, 24 hours later. Yeah. So this is not an indecisive man, Dick no, Donahue. No, 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 no. Um, um, and uh, uh, but I think it had something to do with your expectations when you came into the administration as this idealistic young man, and those expectations didn't really. It was tough at first, right? Right. Um, and just one other point. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, the get your friends off those buses uh, has been reported as, as what Kennedy said to me when the Freedom Riders ran. Um, but it is seldom reported that two weeks after the violence to the Freedom Riders, 
the Attorney General, on orders agreeing with the President, asked the Interstate Commerce Commission for a regulation that would end the segregation signs and segregation in interstate commerce. A year later, it had all happened, and Freedom Riders, a group, went and tested it. Secondly, that executive order on housing, twice it was delayed. I was in Africa in the Peace Corps for Africa, and Paul Sangas was one of our star volunteers when he, not only when he was killed, but when he signed the executive order in housing. So when I left the White House, this library has the memo I gave the president on things still to be done on civil rights. He went, when I went in to say goodbye that I was going to Ethiopia uh, for two years uh, in charge of Africa in general, uh, representative to Africa, he went down the list and he said, I'm going to do every one of these. And he said, you will see. And before he died, we did see he had finally called for civil rights legislation. Whether it would have passed without his death, without the four little girls being killed, we'll never know. Yeah. But Johnson picked up that torch, and it was passed. Do you, Dick, um, you have, you saw Senator Kennedy and then pres mm -hmm. affected by all kinds of things mm -hmm. he saw and experienced mm -hmm. as a campaigner or as a president, most famously, poverty in West, West Virginia. Virginia. But talk a little bit about how set in his ways versus not set in his ways he was. How easy was he to persuade uh, or to absorb something <clears throat> new that was a little jarring? Well, he was very amenable to new ideas and to, uh, and to accepting information. Uh, but changing his position really d d defended upon the uh, method of persuasion that was used. Threats didn't make him affect him at all, but if the validity of your position was sufficient, you could win him over and he could change very, very quickly and adjust to the new reality. Can you think of an example where he almost no. like turned on a dime? <laughs> you should have told me this before. <laughs> uh, where he has one of those eureka mm. moments. I don't think he had eureka moments. No. I, I, and therefore, it was more of a, of a, a dry kind of arguing process yes. where you brought him in information. It wasn't your passion that necessarily had a big impact on him. It was whether you... The power of your persuasion and the logic of your position because he understood all of the ramifications but it was in getting to that and the... Um, I had a very <clears throat> difficult time with Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson oh, was probably as uh, powerful a black male as it was. And he came to my office one day because he found out that I probably could persuade the president. I don't know what he knew I was working on civil rights, but he sat opposite me, and I felt like a second baseman, and he was coming in with his spy spikes up. You know, he said he could, with a stroke of the pen, he could do that, and he hasn't done that yet. I said, well, no, he hasn't. Well, well, you know, what he does about housing, that has some effect on blacks. No, it's, he's going to take this, oh, geez. So, I had a very, very powerful long time, and later I was talking to the president, and I said, you know, you didn't talk to Jackie Robinson the other day. Oh, no, he said, I thought you could do it better. Uh, <laughs> so he was not unfamiliar with the idea of having a senior assistant <laughs> take some of the heat he preferred. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Part of your job. Um, people have been writing questions while we've been talking, and um, in, I'm going to ask them in no particular order. Uh, which will take us, we've taken advantage of the political and civil rights expertise up here to use this as our metaphor for the Kennedy presidency, but some of these questions are much uh, broader. Um, 
and uh, in a couple of cases get on the generational points that Caroline was mentioning in her introduction. And um, <coughs> uh, Roger, because you came a little late and had to learn for yourself, find out for yourself what you thought, maybe this is a good one for you. Recent tapes of President Kennedy have shown that he was very canny about what could be achieved state by state on civil rights. Please explain for this generation why he was the right president at the right time on this issue. First of all, because even though he was through and through a politician, he didn't look like it. He what? He didn't look like yeah. he didn't. It didn't look like Mayor Daley. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and his he, he was so smooth and so physically and mentally attractive. He was witty and he was, uh, you know, knock him dead handsome and trim and so it's something so other than Truman and Eisenhower in the White House, it, it was truly fresh air. And possibilities did occur to people. And, um, and then there were all of these brilliant young men around him. <laughs> Coruscatingly brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, really, it really was a... Um, and we took baths. I mean, it, it kind of politically and nationally, we seem to take an emotional bath because of the difference between this man and what had preceded him. Uh -huh. and, um, and was the, it a difference of kind? Was it, it was or a, a degree? Of, well, first of all, you know, he's born in this century. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's making the change right then. And, um, and, and, the White House was full of youth and vigor. And as, as I told Mr. Donahue him, uh, that he didn't know, he didn't know the, the passions that the rest of us had about him and his buddies who could go up to Hyannisport, you know, and they could play football. Why couldn't we do that? That's what we wanted to do. <laughs> and that's why they were the rock stars before they were even rock stars. That's, that's exactly um, but if, and, and when he said in the inaugural, uh, ask not what, your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That's stuck in people's minds. They, they didn't, and then when he got Sarge and all that energy to put together the Peace Corps, uh, and the people now really wanted to do something. They wanted to make the world better, and they had a sense that it could be made better because they saw this change in Washington. I'm going to come back on that point to Senator Wofford in just a second, but first I want to give this one to Dick since he's a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's often reported that JFK was more interested in foreign affairs than domestic affairs. Is that true? Not in my experience. Uh, he was interested in all affairs. I mean, he was, uh, had the... the <laughs> 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 Welcome to the Kennedy Library, yeah. <laughs> 2011. <laughs> no, his interests were so generally Catholic and so all-encompassing. You would one of the things I found was that you could talk to him about almost any subject, and anyone who came could talk to him about any subject. It might be about rock stars, it might be about athletics, it might be about foreign affairs and all that stuff, and he, his mind would flick from one to another as quickly as it could. And uh, so he was a generally broad-based, um, wise man. But his interests were uh, generally worldly. There's a related one, Senator Wofford, in your, in your own august position in the White House with the office, with the fireplace and the executive office building. Um, did you ever have a chance to go to any of these White House social gathering that celebrated 
American culture no. and arts? Did he just like put a wall between official family and social? No, I didn't feel that either. Huh. Did he ever like call you up out of the blue? Part of the respect you have for a president is the sense of the overload of information, of people, uh, and the limit of time. And uh, I think, you know, every, uh, every time I had a chance to be with the president, um, it was a great occasion. And the two most interesting times were, for me, aside from the, the meeting with King up in the private quarters that we talked about, we're going out to introduce him to, uh, to accompany him as he went out to say farewell to groups of Peace Corps volunteers. The first ones to go, and then when I was going, there were 600 leaving, uh, trained at Georgetown and at Howard University, 300 going to Ethiopia. And on the way back in, he said, you know, this will be really serious, this Peace Corps, when it's 100,000 a year and then in one decade, there'll be a million Americans with first-hand experience in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. <laughs> and, and, and then we'll have a con large constituency for a good foreign policy. And on a previous time with volunteers, on the way back in, he said, you know, we have to someday bring this home on a large scale in America. And, you know, right, right now today, AmeriCorps, which is on a large scale, Ted Kennedy's last bill, um, uh, the Serve America Act, passed with the Republican majority in all committees and in both houses of Congress. Um, the, the Serve America Act authorizes AmeriCorps to grow from 80,000 to 250,000. Um, it is now, by the action of the House of Representatives, uh, the Domestic Peace Corps, uh, and all the other programs of the Corporation of, of, of National Service are to be eliminated in the budget that's just been presented to the country. Um, and um, John Kennedy, I have one thing to say about Dick's answer. If you look at the inaugural address, it makes the case that his deepest interest was America and the world. There isn't, you know, some of us, too, Louis Martin and I discovered there wasn't a single reference to civil rights. And we got two words added at the last At home, minute. right? At home right. and around the world supporting <laughs> human rights. And it was good to get in. But it was, I, the reason I was, I think even without those words, I would have said that was a great inaugural address. There was no domestic issue in it. There was, it was all aside from the call to ask what you can do for your country and what America can do together with others for the world, it was about the world and America's place in the world. And in the rotunda of the Capitol on the same hour, 50 years later, uh, when it, we heard the inaugural address with Caroline there and, and the, the Congress and the Senate, um, we, we heard the address again. I would say, uh, after all has been said on this platform, far more important would be a careful reading from the first big proposition that man now holds in his mortal hands the power to end poverty in the world or to end all human living. Uh, from that first proposition to the end, I think you see a man of the vital center for whom the center held until assassin brought him down. Did the word center have any meaning then, Dick? I suppose it did, but I don't remember it being used uh, in any uh, type of uh, sensitivity. Of what it was concerned about really was the uh, totality of his object of, of his job. I mean, he was inundated by uh, issue after issue Everybody that got in got on their issue and got him ground down a little bit, and he absorbed it so that it was, it was never a compartmentalized uh, presidency. You know, the interesting thing is that we heard, just heard some very, very important people mentioned, Ralph Dungan, Leif White, uh, Louis, Louis Martin. Martin. Louis Martin was one of the giants of all time. Uh, 
but so that there were these types of people around working for him and with him and to him, uh, and that uh, just kept him alive and kept him moving forward. Did you ever feel overwhelmed having to keep up with so many different topics? No. No. <laughs> Coruscatingly no. brilliant. No. <laughs> and again, before I start thinking of a way to wind this down, which is the part of my job that I hate, I, I have one for Roger that goes directly to the, to the work you were doing at the State Department. And that's uh, in the context of emerging democracies in the Arab world today. Did, what role, if any, did President Kennedy play uh, in beginning the process of nurturing democracy in the freshly independent countries uh, of Africa? One of the things he did was to hire um, very uh, distinguished um, specialists in um, educational and uh, agricultural development. Um, we were, got memos time and time again from the White House about uh, remember building, because you know, people wanted money right now, build institutions for the long haul, educational institutions, uh, political institutions, so that these countries can govern themselves de de as uh, Democrats um, with leadership. And we did it um, heavily in places that have not been terribly successful, but uh, we made a terrific effort at uh, South America, in middle and South America, and um, and a democratic base was in virtually every program we sent out there, and you know we did it in Africa now, in lots of places it went terribly sour, um, and you just cringe to think about these countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, but of it, out of them came some very able and effective for people, too. Some of them were in the South African Revolution, um, which probably is the biggest development in Africa since the colonials went away. And they have a lot of people down there who were trained in America by the American aid program. Um, I know less about what our big effort in, in Latin America was because I did Asia and, and Africa and my friend John Fanari working for the administrator did uh, Middle East and uh, um, in a second there are going to be more panels that come up here guys and the next one is going to be composed of people who are omniscient <laughs> they're historians and they're going to pronounce. No, no, I was, uh, I wrote editorials for the New York Times, remember? Ah. <laughs> yeah, they're omniscient too. Some of us, Dick, are, are comfortable not being omniscient. But they will pronounce on what's going to happen to you guys for the next 10,000 years and, <laughs> and whatever. And I wanted to give you a head start um, to, to say your own piece. Dick, have you figured all this out? What, what happened during those 888 days that's of lasting importance to the country that's worth knowing about in detail and learning from? Mostly it's composed right here in this building. All of the stuff that's done here, again, is a reflection of, this, of what he taught. And what we have learned is here. And that's why this is a, so important a structure for me to be involved in, because I see that we can gather again people who know and understand and are learning and teaching about his life and his, what he stood for. And I certainly wouldn't want it to be lessened in any way, but I certainly would not want it to be magnified beyond what it is. 
it is a collection of the thoughts and publications and lives of the people who worked for him and with him. Senator, um, you know, I remember reading somewhere that when when Senator Kennedy got you out of Notre Dame to work on the campaign, they used Joseph Kennedy on Father Hesburgh to get you sprung. Um, so to say that he wanted you in the campaign and then in the White House is a, is a bit of an understatement. But I was wondering if, it, because you've written and spoken on historical subjects, if you figured out where the Kennedy administration fits in a larger historical picture. Well, I think I would put for last words uh, for the day, um, the three figures on the public stage that meant the most to me were John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. And I think the President of the United States today partakes of some of the qualities of all three of those He's an original, but I think that he showed the way that Johnson carried forward until Vietnam almost destroyed his administration and damaged the country and the world. Um, I think he pointed the way to how the vital center can hold. And we have a president who is doing his best to do just that. And I think the degree to which the 50th anniversary of the JFK 50 plans of the library take hold uh, that we can get some light for today and uh, I, th I think if we get immersed in this celebration we will see what our duty is today. Now, how <clears throat> Roger, finally, as one, just one of all these idealistic young people who came to Washington any way they could 50 years ago, um, do you regret it at all? Um, and have you figured out uh, where President Kennedy is in the grander picture? Oh, no. I'm, if I were sitting here not having gone to the administration when I did, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> because I, there would be no reason to ask me what I thought. Because, um, it, I, it was about as exciting and wonderful a thing that could happen in the United States with the, maybe the exception of, of, of coming out of the depression. Um, but that generation, this is the last, the, the, the first generation born in this century. Well, that generation took an America that had not quite figured out its role in the world when it got stuck in the world. And now that was ready to be in the world. And so I think of that and I think of my own nephew, who went off to the Peace Corps in the middle of Niger, where the, 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 the Sahara Desert <laughs> is coming down, and he stayed and spent not one, but two, but three tours helping these gardeners build the, uh, the gardens that could feed them. That's what I think about. That's America is going out and doing that kind of thing. I think it's wonderful. The um before we give this to the historians, I, I just, we didn't talk much about the president's rhetoric. There's a little story, ironically, from an Oliver Stone movie uh, about Nixon, um, who comes down to the White House pantry late one night, a little drunk, and talks to his manservant, Manolo Sanchez. And he's always fixated on Kennedy, can't get him out of his mind. And he said, you know, why did you weep when, when President Kennedy died? And Manolo Sanchez looks at Nixon and says, he made me see the stars. Um, and um, it's something to think about when you ponder questions of, of, of leadership. 
uh, that are st about a guy who is still amazing 50 years later. So with that, we give it to the historians and...